I'm aware of plants and so, you know, you, as you grow up, you're always looking at nature, I think. And so coming from Fraser Island, I'm a keen observer of uh, different types of species that grow in different um, locations on the island. And on the mainland, where I also uh, spend a lot of time, at, out at Burrell, there are these um, beautiful mangroves and we used to go walking out on the um, mud flats and you'd collect things while well, we were principally going out looking for oysters so there was a um, purpose to walking on the mud flats but when you're out there you also find a lot of flotsam and jetsam washed up and mangroves uh, for some reason have fascinated me and I think then you start to develop other areas of interest and so the opium poppy has featured strongly in this show but that relates specifically to something else which was the protection of aboriginals and the restriction of the sale of opium act which was introduced in 1897. That particular act was very detrimental to aboriginal people because there were 32 sections to the Act and it brought in laws that govern people's lives. And so it was the first time where people are being told how to live their lives and they're being told how to live their lives by the state government. So a part of that process, one of the facets of that Act was that they were told who they could and couldn't marry. They were told where they could live they were um, put into missions that were either run by the state or missions that were run by a religious denomination. So it really impacted on people's movement, um, people's process to make their own decisions for their own families. And so it started to quarantine people and um, break down the laws that govern their society um, previously. And so that um, act has led me in a whole new area of research where I've looked at opium poppies um, and filmed them and also made etchings about them, done sculptures about them. And so one thing leads to something else and it just triggers your fascination for another uh, plant species, I guess. The Bliss DVD was filmed in Tasmania because that's where they actually grow opium poppies and uh, I wanted to be authentic. I didn't want just any old poppies in someone's garden. I wanted the work to really uh, contain that particular opiate that's, you know, that people get high on. And so it's very um, trance-like when you're watching the DVD. So you're caught in this beautiful pink sway that's sort of like this and then you start to see the uh, overlay of the quotes that come up at the bottom. And then you start to realise there's a bigger picture going on here. It's not just about poppies swaying in the breeze. <laughs> it was a way to manoeuvre people off the land so that the new settlers could occupy a uh, country that was once owned by, let's say, the Butchler people or Yubira people or different nations. People were still taking opium after the Act was introduced. It, uh, Permits were still being issued by the state government well into like 1904, 1905. You can see on the records that uh, licences were being given to white Australians and Chinese Queenslanders. And the recipient, the, the main recipient of that particular 
uh, drug, if you like, was uh, Aboriginal people. And Aboriginal people were get, being given opium ash or opium drugs in return for a free labour force because there weren't many people on the in Queensland and who were prepared to work um, hard labour and it was also during a period when a lot of people had moved up to the gold fields and were digging on the gold fields so there was a shortage of labour anyway so there are you know different ways that uh, people's lives are impacted through a shortage of labour and also taking this uh, form of payment that was given to Aboriginal people. You have disease that's introduced, like venereal disease. Um, principally, it's a f a infecting Aboriginal women. You have physical violence, so you have punitive and organised um, state-funded massacres that are happening. Then you have starvation because people are being forced off their land. Christianity is introduced, so that disrupts like a, a traditional language, ceremony and religious belief system. Then you have opium addiction introduced, like opium, uh, to people uh, for uh, indentured labour force. Then you have kidnapping of Aboriginal children that's also running concurrently to all of this. And then you have new state laws that are imposed and acted upon a race of people. And so it's just not one thing that happens. You have a wave of new systems that are coming into place. And Aboriginal bachelor people, while this is all taking place, has put up a 20-year resistance to the local town folk of Meribara. And so someone like uh, Raymond Evans talks about that in writing about race fighting words. And, but that's never talked about in this country, the strong nation after nation after up. nation. What I'm starting to realise is when I do all of this research, um, I put it into, into different bodies of work. And so really what I'm trying to do is reach out to you as an audience and pull you in and have a conversation with you. The problem is that none of you are aware of this history. Why don't you know about this stuff? Why is it someone like me working in the arts or someone in theatre or some historian that has to, you know, put this out in the public arena. Why aren't we knowledgeable about our own history in this country? I have this uh, immense sense of loss that we have here in this country. And as a child, I understood loss from a very early age, particularly in relation to my bachelor forebears and the culture that once was. And so in the catalogue, there, one of the first things you see in the catalogue when it comes out on Monday is a quote by Sophocles, a Greek philosopher, and it says, ignorant men don't know what good they hold in their hands until they've flung it away. And for me, that really resonates because ignorant men in this country have flung away rich, a rich, sophisticated, beautiful cultures with Aboriginal nations here. And we lost that and there's no way of going back. So I am deeply scarred because of that loss. And I think many other people here are deeply scarred because of that loss also. Nulla Forever was really a uh, process of looking at different races here in Australia. Some races like Chinese Australians have been, let's say, in Queensland since 1848, so there's a long history. But we don't ever really get a sense of that here in Australia. It always seems to be like this black-white binary, Aboriginal, non-Aboriginal. It seems, for me, as an Indigenous person, that's the dominant sort of discourse or debate in this country. So when you have 
newly arrived immigrants to Australia, the focus of that particular discussion was on about was about white Australians or Anglo Australians looking at uh, Arabs who'd recently come to this country or Muslim people and so there was a huge um, shift in the cultural landscape here particularly after um, you know 9-11 so you know governments have set up a type of um, a way of looking at uh, Muslim people differently and I think a lot of Australians bought into that level of suspicion that they may feel towards people who are Lebanese or from Ar various Arab backgrounds and so it was a process of trying to unravel what took place at Cronulla Beach and so that particular episode I think happened in 2005. This work is very new for me. The photographic series Nulla Forever took place in 2009 so it's still very fresh but you know I'm trying to work with different groups of people in the series so there's uh, people acting out and play acting. Some of it for me is a little bit historical and some of it is contemporary. In one of the frames with Nulla Forever, you do see a man smoking an opium pipe, but that comes about because the work is looking also historically at different types of relationships in this country where you have uh, Aboriginal people mingling with Chinese people, and I think it's not often seen in Australian artwork that relationship between Aboriginal people and Chinese and it was very prevalent in Queensland and there was a complexity to those relationships and the act that was introduced in 1897 also introduced um, that it was illegal for Chinese men to marry Aboriginal women and so you have these social mechanism being set up and it's a type of eugenics where people, particularly Aboriginal people in this country, are told who they can and can't marry. So it's a form of social experimentation. So you don't see that crossover very much in a visual way and I wanted to articulate that in the Nulla Forever series where we have Aboriginal people conversing with Chinese Australians. So that, for me, is very important. I don't think teachings influence my art practice. I think I make art and that I like to talk about it in an education environment. I like to give lectures and talk to students about certain aspects of the work and ask them questions and get them fired up. So it plays more of a that type of role. And I really see my work in a broader context where it's really educating people about their own history. And so for me, if I can do that with one person or one student and they understand precisely what I'm talking about through this visual language, then I feel like I've accom accomplished a lot. And so it's just basically, I just see the work that I do as a footprint, you know, and for my lifetime I can keep talking about um, aspects of you know, colonial history that fascinate me and put that into the public arena. So something feeds into this area or thematic area and something feeds into that. And I don't know, it's just, that's it, that's all I know. <laughs>